Alexander Waugh's interpretation of the painting you're looking at is based on the fact that in the picture, Sir John Suckling is wearing ancient Greek gear. It is on this premise that Mr. Waugh bases his idea that Sir John is on a pilgrimage to the oracle at Delphi. The problem with this argument is that it was pretty routine at the time for young, wealthy men to be painted in vaguely Greek costume. Van Dyck painted several. The word Arcadian is applied to such portraits, which is a reference to a mythical romantic idea of shepherds and shepherdesses indulging in enthusiastic ancient frolicking, probably involving sheep. So, actually, his entire argument is built not so much on sand as on wet diarrhoea, but it is fun to watch his thought processes. It's an interesting glimpse into the mind of a conspiracy theorist. All roads will lead to Delphi simply because Mr. War is so uninterested in all other roads that he doesn't even notice them. Firstly, why does Mr. War want to prove that Sir John Suckling is being depicted at Delphi? Well, anyone who looks at the so-called authorship question is bound to ask sooner or later why none of Shakespeare's contemporaries had a problem with the idea of the man from Stratford writing some plays and poems. After all, if there was an insuperable obstacle to this for people of limited formal education, then the people of the time were best placed to judge. Yet those obstinate Elizabethans and Jacobeans stubbornly refused to raise a single doubting voice. Thus, it is important to find people of the period saying, albeit in heavily coded messages, that of course they knew that the ignorant oik from Stratford wasn't the writer. Since Shakespeare's work features heavily in this painting, Mr. Waugh wants to find a way of showing that Van Dyck and John Suckling both thought that Edward de Vere was the true author. Taking him to Delphi increases the opportunities for smoke, mirrors, distraction and deflection. One of Mr. War's first points is the expression on Suckling's face as he stares into the middle distance. What is he thinking of? Is he perhaps listening to something? Why the rapt expression? What Mr. War wants the expression to mean is that he is listening to the words of the Delphic Oracle. It could equally be severe constipation, of course, but as it happens, the painter has given us a rattling big clue about what he's contemplating, because Sir John is holding a Shakespeare folio edition open at the beginning of Hamlet. Why, in a rain of pig's pudding, would you assume that he's thinking about anything other than that? If he's not contemplating the works of Shakespeare, why is he holding the enormous volume open? Isn't that Van Dyke screaming at the viewer? No, you fool, that's not constipation or trapped wind. He's thinking about Hamlet. Mr. War claims to see a bay laurel, Loris nobilis, in the picture. I have looked repeatedly at the section of the painting that he highlights. All I can see is a bedraggled weed in the foreground with distant trees behind it. I can only suggest that you judge for yourself. However... Even if we did accept the dubious assertion that either the bedraggled brown-leafed weed or one of the vague green blobs behind it is Loris nobilis, it's weird to assume that this takes us to Delphi. Julius Caesar wore a laurel crown. Laurels represent victory. Poets in portrait engravings are also frequently depicted wearing a crown of laurels. Here's Ben Jonson, for example, as shown in his works. So... Even if there was a laurel, so what? Suckling was a poet. It would be perfectly appropriate to the subject to slip in a few bay leaves. No need to rouse the Delphic Sibyl from her ouzo-induced slumbers. Next comes the rock. Yes, the rock. Mr. War claims that Van Dyck has painted faces onto it and is clearly trying to indicate that Suckling is in a place of magic and wonder where rocks might be possessed by demons, such as the home of the Oracle. Mr. War is the only commenter who thinks this. The commentary at the Frick Museum, where the painting is exhibited, says no such thing. Neither does the curator, Xavier Salomon. I certainly don't see any faces in the rock. Maybe I lack imagination. But actually, if you take a picture of a cliff face, then your phone will often identify faces in it, Mine does. So even if you're only a Samsung Android, you'll find faces in rocks if you're looking for them. I think Mr. War is trying just that bit too hard here. 
But suppose there were faces. Should that necessarily lead to Delphi? Why not Catholic purgatory, or the burning victims of the Inquisition, or the devils cast into hell after the conquest of Lucifer? Nope, we are heading for Delphi, come hell or highly ridiculous. Frolicking, here we come. Mr War's next clue is that the painter has put the first folio on the wrong page for Hamlet. Well... Actually, there's a massive assumption here, and as a devout lapsed Catholic, I'd say that the only person who's allowed to make assumptions is the Virgin Mary. You see, there's no way of knowing that this is meant to be the first folio. Arguably, it's more likely to be the second folio of 1632, published just six years before the date of this painting. If that were the case, then the page numbering about which Mr. War makes a great fuss would be completely different. Hamlet begins on page 272 in the second folio, not 153, which completely screws up Mr. War's other assumption, because apparently the number 153 is in some way linked to Edward de Vere. Happily, Mr. War doesn't go into any detail on this. His explanations of such things involve the Masons, the Rosicrucians, John D, number systems based on the Greek and Latin alphabet and other assorted hocus-pocus. Given such a broad range of options, it's unsurprising that he can usually jiggle pretty much any number, name, shape or misprint into something of significance. But even if it is the first folio that's being depicted, it's apparent that Van Dyck has not tried to reproduce the actual page anyway. Here is the title page of Hamlet from the first folio. And here's the representation of it in the painting. See what I mean? Van Dyck is pretty well just making it up. And it seems he just used the page in the most convenient place for the viewer to get the idea that Sir John likes Hamlet. Simple and bleeding obvious. But it's the interpretation of the motto on the painting, bottom right, that I find most hilarious. Ne te quesiveris extra. Do not look outside yourself. It's in Latin, so it can hardly be claimed as the utterance of a Greek oracle. Thus, a smokescreen is provided in the shape of the paean to Apollo. He makes the assumption, another one, that this hymn would be used in order to evoke the oracle. The paean begins, Io, Io. I would draw your attention to the precipitous leap of logic here. In order to interpret a Latin motto, he invokes a Greek god and the first line of a Greek hymn in his praise. There are some who can't see a conclusion without jumping to it, and the urbane Mr. War is clearly one of them. I have to say that for me, I-O-I-O -O should be followed by It's off to work we go, but for Mr. War, this is a secret signalling of 10-10, which he interprets as an instruction to split the motto into two blocks of 10 words, which gives us veris at the beginning of the second block of 10, which can be grammatically shifted to a different declension of the word, don't ask me why, into veer, making the motto mean don't look outside of veer. Of course, and there's a much more logical and less tortured possibility in interpreting the motto. One of the greatest of Hamlet's lines is, Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, which is pretty much the same as don't look outside yourself, which would mean that the motto is an echo of one of the lines in the play which he's supposed to be reading. That would seem to be very much in tune with what's going on in the painting. A reference to the book that features prominently in it, rather than to the god of Apollo, who doesn't feature at all. Another rendering, according to one of the commentaries on the painting, interprets this as simply, we don't need to look outside our own culture for poets we can emulate, which also makes perfect sense in the context of an English writer of 1638, speaking of his countryman, William Shakespeare, whose book he is pictured reading. I'd like to conclude by stating the bleeding obvious. It's 1638. The country is about to erupt in civil war. Charles I has been reigning as absolute monarch for nine years, and the parliamentary faction are not happy about it. The first stirrings of discontent are being voiced in Scotland, where in 1637 congregations had rioted over the introduction of the new prayer books. They will soon lead to the Bishop's Wars. Edward de Vere has been dead for 34 years. Shakespeare has been dead for 22 years. What would be the result of simply stating boldly 
that Edward de Vere really wrote the work. I would guess the effect would be a tiny fraction of bugger all. If Sir John Suckling had really believed that Vere was the author, he didn't need codes, pictures, grammatical jiggery-pokery and numerology. He could have just said it. The sky would not have fallen in. But it wasn't true. And that's why he didn't say it. Instead, Sir John Suckling simply had his portrait done, wearing some dodgy Greek gear, as was the fashion, standing in front of a plant that wasn't a laurel and a rock with no faces in it, holding a book that was written by a talented man who just happened to come from Stratford-upon-Avon. Boring, eh?